Okay. Okay, so let's get started. So first of all, Yechimo, greetings. Yet I say we thank you for tuning in, joining in with our sixth annual online conference. So typically we have our conference on around the summer solstice. We had to push it back around, you know, June 21st, June 20th each year. This is the sixth year. We had to push it back a couple of weeks just because of uh, logistical reasons. Normally we have an event um, in here in Washington, D.C., we have a number of vendors, um, people, different presenters speaking on different aspects of principal values of Amaniye nationism, the purification of nationalism. This year, of course, because of the, the entire, you know, COVID issue, there are certain venues that are still not renting um, their spaces here in D.C., so we just decided to have an online presentation to address um, the major issue, that major issue that's, you know, affecting us at this point. So. First, we want to talk a little bit about the philosophy, the philosophical foundation of Amaniye nationism, the purification of nationalism. So when we say Ojiraman, purified nation, and first of all, my name is Ojirafo Kwesi Ranehemata Akan, Ojirafo of Akwamumayana Maruka Tifi Mudi Akwamu Nation in North America. So um, when we talk about Ojiraman, let's, let's get into some detail about that. So this first, what you see on the screen, is one of the journals that we published um, for one of our conferences. In fact, this one was for the third annual conference. We would always give away a copy of the journal, the book for that particular year. So as you can see, it says Ojira Maina Fashe, which means festival or coming together and so forth. Um, 13,018, which is 2018. We don't track time based on a fictional cartoon character, Jesus, who never existed of any form. So we use the proper year. We're in the midst of an Afe Kessie, a great year, great year cycle, 26,000 year cycle, hence the years beginning with 13,000, the astronomical cycle that, that can be tracked and quantified and so forth. So, Ojiramana <clears throat> Fashe, purified nation, Apurakanu, Apuraikaidu, Africans, Black people in the Western Hemisphere. And as you see, it says Amaniye, Afurakani, Afurakani, African Black Nationism, Purification of Nationalism. So the reason why we um, established this conference, this is one of uh, one of three major conferences, festivals that we have throughout the course of our year. Our year begins in September on the autumn equinox, the Atem, Atemet equinox, and that is our New Year's Day. That's the harvest time, but it's also the seeding time. It's the end time when you harvest the fruits and so forth, but it's also the time to seed and begin a new cycle. So we have our New Year, we have a seven day New Year observance within Akoma Mine and Maruka Tifimudi Akoma Nation in North America um, from September 16th through the 22nd or September 17th through the 23rd, depending on the year, depending on when the equinox is. If the equinox is on the 23rd, then it's our seven day observance is the 17th through the 23rd. If it lands on the 22nd, our observance is from the 16th, September 16th through the 22nd. So. Um, so that's our new year. And then three years, three weeks after our New Year's Day, we have our Hudu Mind, Hudu Nation Festival, where we uh, address Akan and Susque religion in North America, which is the Hudu tradition. And we go into detail about that specifically. But then in March, around the uh, spring equinox, we have the, the Kepri Keprit, or spring equinox. We have our Echi sign. And first, let me show you the so you can see the 
covers and so forth. So this is our from our journal, our Etchy Sign Journal. But before we get to that, this is our from our Hudu Mayan Festival. So we have that in October where we deal with Akan ancestral religion in North America. But then in March, around the spring equinox, we have our Etchy Sign ancestral religious Afurakani, Afurakani, the African ancestral religious reversion conference. We deal with ancestral religion in its varied forms manifest in the Western hemisphere, specifically in North America. So we have, for example, the Akan ancestral religion. When our Akan ancestresses and ancestors were forced into North America, they continued, we continued Akan ancestral religion under the Akan term Undu. Undu means medicine from roots, trees, and plant life. Undu also means to become heavy with the spirit through spirit possession and spirit communication. So that term Undu became pronounced Hudu in this dialect in the Western Hemisphere, but that is Akan ancestry religion. But we also have Juju, which is a Yoruba term. So when Yoruba people were forced into the Western Hemisphere, they continued Yoruba ancestry religion under the term Juju. Um, you have Wanga, which is the Obambo tradition. You have Voodoo, which is the Eve and Phone tradition and so forth. So a number of different things. Um, hold on one second. I need to. Uh... Okay, so we have our Etchy Sign Conference and Sustra Religious Reversion Conference, and that is um, Spring Equinox. And then around the uh, summer solstice, we have our Ojida Mind Conference. And hold on one second. There's one thing I was trying to post. Give me one second. Uh, somebody was trying to get into the the chat. I just want to make sure we are on point with that. Just take me a second. And of course, if you have any questions about any of the information, um, you can <clears throat> you can post it in the uh, chat room. Okay, so this should allow them to get in. Okay. Okay, so we have those three major conferences. Um, so, but the Ojeda Mind Conference, we deal with, so we deal with ancestral religious reversion, going back to our ancestral religious practices, born of our spirit genetic blood circles, that we've preserved for hundreds of years here in the Western Hemisphere. And today we're going to show the intersection between ancestral religion and nationism, purification of nationalism in a very specific context. So Ojira Mind, the reason why we use the term Ojira Mind in the lang language of ancient Kanit and Kemet, which is our ancestral language, you'll find that over 40,000 years ago, our civilizations were established in Kanit, Nubia, Kemet, Egypt, and so forth. And the language and ritual practices and so forth that you find there, you find that we migrated to different parts of the continent and carried that same ancestral religious practice as well as language with us. So whether you're talking about Basa people or Fula people or Akan people or Yoruba people or Igbo people or Kosa people or various groups, this goes back to tens of thousands of years ago, pre-dynastic commit tens of thousands of years ago, our people established civilization and carried that civilization across the continent. So we still have those same practices. So 
in the ancient language, the term Jida means pure or purified. The term Omain means nation. The mine also means West, land of the setting sun. And those same terms that you find in the language of ancient Kanid and Kemet, you find, for example, in the Akan language with the same meanings and the same and the proper vocalizations. So, for example, You see the term spelled in the Medutu, the hieroglyphs and so forth, T-W-R-A, and sometimes with the, the palm, hand with the open palm is the D sound. So D-W-R, Jida, it means in the language of ancient Kemet to be clean, to cleanse, to purify, to celebrate a ceremony of purification, purified and so forth. So, but you'll find that the Akan term or Jida means purification, it also means to celebrate a ceremony of purification. So just like in ancient Kemet, Jida means purification, to cleanse, to purify, and also to celebrate a ceremony of purification. We have the same term, with the same meaning in Akan. The major ceremony of purification of Ojida in Akan culture is the new year. The new year is called Ojida. That's the new year's celebration. But then you also have ritual purification when you cleanse your head spiritually and so forth. That is um, Jida as well, that is a ritual purification ceremony. So it means to pure, purify, to purify, to cleanse, but also to celebrate a ceremony of purification, same term in our ancient language preserved in the language today. Then you have the term Mai, M-A-N, but Mai or Mainu, it means a city, town or city, or region, a nation, a polity. And as we've shown, teaching our class, we have a class um, on reading and writing the Medu Ntoro, the Medu Ntoro, sometimes people say Medu Netra, but the Medu Ntoro, the hieroglyphs, the language of ancient Kemet. We have that class, we're going to part two, starting in a couple of weeks, we just finished part one. But when we were going through that class, people who are familiar, you'll see that the Newt symbol represents a nation, a city, a settlement, a group of people, a town, a polity, and so forth. So that's the determinative symbol for that. But mine, or my new, a town, a city, a nation, a polity, and so forth. But mine, also my new, the land of the setting sun, the West. So Ojira means, Ojira Mai means the purified Ojira, mine, nation, mine, West, land of the setting sun. Ojidaman is the purified nation of Akurakani, Afrakani people, African Black people in the West, the land of the setting sun. Now, we'll also find that in the Akan language, Main means a city, a town, a nation, a government, a people. The related term, Amainone, means a country abroad. So just like Main means nation, group of people, region, and so forth, but it also means West land of the setting sun, which is abroad, and ancient Kanid and Kemet, the same definitions, two definitions for the same term you find in the Akan language. Now let's go down and give you a, a little information, a little proof of that. So as you can see, this is from the Asante Fanti Dictionary, the Akan Dictionary and so forth. Mine or Omain, a town, a collection of houses larger than a village, a body of inhabitants of a country, a nation, tribe, people, state, the people and so forth. So Omain means a nation and so forth. Um, a group of people, but a region, a state. Amain, none a foreign country, meaning some place abroad. So that same definition of mine, meaning nation, state, or polity, mine also meaning, you know, um, land of the west, land of the setting sun. We are in the extreme west of Afuraka, Afuraka in Africa. We're in a nation abroad. So we're the purified Ujira nation, mine, um, 
in the West, the land of the setting sun, Oman. Now, so, and of course, this is for specifically Afro-Akani, Afro-Akani, African Black people exclusively. So Ojiraman is our designation for Afurakanu, Afurite, Kaitnut Africans, Black people who are descendants genetically and spiritually of Afurakanu, Afurite, Kaitnut, who were forced into the Western Hemisphere as a result of what an Akan is called the Musuo Kesie, the Great Perversity, the Enslavement Era. Our Aku, Aku to our spiritually cultivated ancestresses and ancestors, that's a term in ancient Kemet for that, in our kind is Nanano Nsamanko, our spiritually cultivated class of ancestresses and ancestors purified themselves to it with, through adherence to Nanasom ancestral religion and Amamre ancestral culture, and were thus able to free themselves from enslavement, waging war incessantly against the whites in their own spring. So those of our people who maintain their ancestral religious practices, those are the individuals who planned, plotted, established independent sovereign nations away from the plantations because they planned, plotted, waged war against the white snarl spring, poisoned them through root work, the precedent for chemical and biological warfare, poisoning the food and so forth of the white snarl spring, then becoming ill and so forth, burning down plantations, grabbing weapons and so forth, killing the white snarl spring, escaping from the plantations, liberating themselves, establishing independent sovereign nations away from the plantations that lasted for centuries, for example, Dismal Swamp in Virginia, um, North Carolina and so forth, you'll find that over 2000 of our people lived in that area intergeneration. During the enslavement era, they had freed themselves, established an independent sovereign state in the Dismal Swamp, getting, as we said, close to 2000 people and so forth. The Whites and Arrow Springs sent militias into the dismal swamp to try to drag those people back into enslavement, but we had a formidable army. They were never able to drag our people back into enslavement, and that was not the only settlement. So those who maintained adherence to ancestral religion and culture, they were guided by the ancestresses and ancestors and the abosom, the divinities, on the best means by which to wage war against the white snarl spring, free themselves from enslavement, and establish and defend their independent sovereign nation. We follow that example today. So, and they're ultimately, they're the ones who forced the end of enslavement because they waged war against the whites in their offspring, forcing war and so forth. They ended up forcing the civil war when we talk about the Gullah Wars and so forth against the United States that they'll call the Seminole Wars, but they were really the Gullah Wars, forcing the United States Army into a, a extended conflict and so forth, which led to the civil war our people participated in that to force the end of enslavement across the entire continent. So, but it was powered by our people who were animated by our ancestry, religion, and culture. Now, now we talk about the nature of an Oman, the nature of a nation. There's a difference between secular nationalism, messianic nationalism, and these different forms of nationalism that are modeled after the whites and their offspring and their pseudo philosophy. This is why we talk about nationism, the purification of nationalism, because we have a proper understanding of what a nation actually is rooted in our own culture. Now, we said we're Ojiraman, the purified nation of Afurakani, Afurakani people in the Western Hemisphere, are a unique collective of Afurakani, Afurakani people, African Black people, within the larger community of you know, Black people around the world, but we're a unique collective. We have the capacity, and we say because we share experiences and blending of blood circles spirit genetically. So when we talk about an Oman, a nation, a collection, a group of people, when we were forced into this hemisphere and our people escaped from enslavement, established independent sovereign states and so forth, nations, what we also did was we began to interact and interface with this region of the Earth Mother's body, Asase Afu is the fertile Earth Mother in our Khan tradition. Asase Ya is the barren Earth Mother who receives the corpse and so forth in the Akan tradition. In ancient Kemet, that's Asase Nebetetepet, the wife of Atem, and Asase Nebetet, 
the wife of Kepra, in the Yoruba tradition that is Onile, the fertile earth mother, and Yewa, the barren earth mother that receives the corpse and so forth. So there's always been the twin earth mother divinities and you will find them across, you know, the continent and wherever we exist in the world because we attune to these earth mother divinities. And we're talking about the fertile earth mother and so forth when we migrated and were forced to migrate to this region of the Western hemisphere, we escaped from enslavement and so forth. We began to interface with the Abosom, the deities, the Orisha that manifest in their unique expression in this region of the earth mother's body. We began to interface with the earth mother divinities in this region of their body. We take in the food, plant life, mineral life, sometimes animal life, manifest in this region of the earth mother's body. So that there's a shift that takes place. Of course, we're living in areas, some of us, we came into areas and we're enslaved in areas where snowfall happened. That's something that never you know, occurred before. We never experienced that before. But even the plant life, the herb, the, the medicine and so forth, we had to attune to this region of the earth mother's body attuned to the divinity and so forth, learn how to uh, procure herbs and plant life and mineral life for medicine, herbs that we never came in contact with before, plant life we never came in contact with before, mineral life and so forth, certain animals and so forth. We had to learn how to incorporate that, align ourselves with the earth mother in this region of her body, align ourselves with the unique expression of the Abosom, the Orisha, the Bodu, the forces in nature as they manifest in this region of the earth mother's body. So we're drawn to a specific region. We're drawn, listening to the forces of nature that govern us, we're drawn to a certain region. We coalesce in that specific region that we're drawn to of the Earth Mother's body. We take in the plant life, animal life, mineral life, which transforms our cells to a certain degree. But then we blend ancestral blood circles and those that blending of ancestral blood circles with that unique energy from this plant life and animal life and mineral life in this region of the earth mother's body, as well as being possessed by the Abosom, the Orisha, the Vodou, as they manifest their unique expression of energy from this region of the earth mother's body that changes our energetic disposition. So we have a unique expression of energy after having blended ancestral blood circles in a certain specific new region of the earth mother's body, and then having children and bringing ancestresses and ancestors back through those new blended blood circles with a different energy stamp. That gives us a unique expression of Afurakani, Afurakani, African Black culture. We have everything that we've inherited from migrating from the continent. We have, you know, the same DNA, of course, and we brought the same culture. But then in addition to that, the way that culture is expressed is based on the region of the Earth Mother that we have migrated to and indigenized ourselves to. Only Afro-Akani, afro -Akani people, African Black people can indigenize themselves or ourselves to a region of the earth. Just moving to a certain region of the earth and saying I'm indigenous because I, I was the first to move here, that's totally inaccurate. First of all, our people were the first to move all over the world, all over the globe before the whites and our offspring existed on earth. So they're not indigenous to any place at all. They're just invaders to every place that they come to. But even when you talk about Siberians, Asians, white Asians migrating and invading the Western Hemisphere and coming in contact with our people who are already here, that doesn't make them indigenous because they migrated to a place and were in a place in Alaska or somewhere else and they didn't see anybody around so they happen to be indigenous. That's a white false definition of indigenization. The only way you can be indigenous to a land is if you migrate to that area drawn to that area by the earth mother divinity herself. You interface with that divinity, become possessed by the divinity, as well as the abosom, the deities who manifest in the rivers, the mountains, the different features of that region of the earth mother's body. The energy gets inside of your body through spirit possession and spirit communication. That energy transforms your cells because that energy in this region is different from the energy in, in, in another region. And then when you incorporate that, and that transforms your cells, now you are vibrating at the frequency of this specific region of the Earth Mother's body through direct communication with her. And then when you have children and bring them into, you know, into the world, the sperm cell of the male, the open cell of the female is vibrating at a new frequency, a slightly different frequency than before. And the spirit that enters into that 
zygote and becomes an embryo and develops into a child and so forth. And it's born as the first born indigenized to the land. If you cannot connect with the forces in nature that animate the region of the land that you migrated to, then you can't become indigenized or aligned with that region of the earth. None of the whites in their offspring can do that. That includes white Europeans, white Asians who migrated over here and erroneously referred to themselves as Native Americans and so forth. It includes white Hindus and white Hispanics and so forth. Only black people have the capacity to be uh, possessed by the deities, communicate with the divinities, indigenize themselves to a, any landmass anywhere. So some of our people have done that when we were forced into this region and so forth, migrated, coalesced, you know, align ourselves with the forces of nature in this region and brought ancestresses and ancestors back through these newly blended ancestral blood circles. So we have a unique energetic stamp, a unique energetic disposition. We are a unique collective of Akurakani, Afrakani people in the Western hemisphere, a unique collective in relation to the larger collective um, of Afurakani, Afrakani people, African black people in the world. Now, we say that the attainment of our complete independence as a self-governing nation on our own territory and secure in the absolute defense of our sovereignty. We have the capacity and responsibility today to complete that process of nation building restoration begun by our Aku Akutu, our spiritually cultivated ancestresses and ancestors. And that is that attainment of um, sovereignty and the securing of that sovereignty. Second, there's somebody trying to get in. Okay. So the reason why we use this imagery, once again, this is the term in the Medutu for Jida, and then this is the term for mind. So this spells out Jida mind. The Okore. It's a term in Akan for an eagle. It's a sacred achinebwa or animal totem for Afurakanu, Afurakanu in the Western Hemisphere. We show the eagle flying over the Okore, flying over the um, waters of Bosom, Opo, and Epo Abena. Those are the male and female Abosom deities that govern the Atlantic Ocean, oceans in general, but the Atlantic Ocean and so forth. That's this image here. And of course, you see the um, Western Hemisphere, right side up. We have South at the top, North at the bottom, which is the proper area orientation. So that's the reason we have that particular image. And then, of course, the you know, that's the image of the landmass right here. And the reason why we also use the Mara Mountains in Sudan, which is ancient Kani, Nubia. The blood, dust, blood cells and so forth, Nana Kwame Afrani, which is George Washington Carver, root worker, Nana Abena Aramita, Harriet Tubman and so forth. We did a broadcast called Soil to Soul, Afurakanu, Afurakani, Afrikani, African Ancestral Religion in the Blood, an unbroken spirit genetic inheritance. So. Now, when we talk about the world body or collective, collections of various cells functioning together as organs and so forth, all Afurakani, Afurakani people, we comprise a world body. And then within that world body, there are different organs and so forth, different collections of cells that work together in a, in a harmonious fashion. Ojira mind, the purified nation, Afurakanu, Afurakaitnut, Africans, Black people in the West, we're a manifestation of that kind of collective. In the West, we have died and resurrected like the Abosom Alsar. Alsar is called Kaniti Amintiu, the first of the Westerners when he dies and then is resurrected and so forth. After his purification, he's called Kaniti Amintiu, the chief or head of those in the West. And our people died and resurrected, died to culture to a certain extent on the surface, but then restored that culture and that restoration of culture is what powered us to wage war 
free ourselves, establish independent sovereign states. And we're in the same process today. Um, we have restored ourselves like the Abosom, the divinity, our sect, who after her expulsion from Kemet, found Osar, united with him and facilitated his resurrection. And she ultimately conceived and gave birth to Heru, who would restore the nation, purification through revolution, resolution. So she was designated Ogura Hennu Ntoru, the great one, the chieftainess of the divinities. So that whole cosmological story of the death and resurrection of Asar and the purification through our set and so forth um, tells also the story of our population as a world black body inclusive of us. And as a matter of fact, let's just look at that really quickly. We did a specific article and uh, and a broadcast um, related to that. Let me see if we put it in the... Uh... Hold on one second. I just want to see if, if it was in this particular one. I think it was in the second year, second volume. Okay, so we did a broadcast just to give a cosmological context to Ojiraman, the purified nation. Um, Osara said in the enslavement and restoration of the Afurakani, Afurai Kaitnit, African in Amenti in the West. So Kam Ur is the title of Osara, is the great Ur, black one, Kam. Kamet Urat, title of Oset, is the great black one and so forth as well. So when we look at these ships of enslavement, and the black bodies forced into these vessels. Osar is Kam Ur, the great black one, is representative of the world collective body of Afurakani, Afurakani people. So when he, the great black one, the great black body was thrown into this sarcophagus and tossed in the water and so forth, and eventually the body is found. We throw, go through the entire cosmology um, in this particular article, we're not going to go through the, every single piece of it. There we were talking about the difference between uh, Kamet and Deshert. In ancient Kemet, you see the blacks and the reds and so forth, dark brown people with red undertones, dark brown people with black undertones, so Kam or Kamet and so forth, the black people and so forth, we were showing the relationship there cosmologically. So when you look at the story of Osar said in Heru and so forth, Osar is killed, uh, thrown in the water and so forth. Um, you know, Set takes over, rules commit in tyrannical fashion and so forth. People are suffering and so forth. Osar's body is mummified. Eventually he's resurrected. Osset unites with Osar spiritually becomes impregnated, gives birth to Heru. Heru grows up, wages war against Set and his followers, destroys them and restores balance. And you see the great black one was thrown in the sarcophagus, thrown into the water and so forth, captured by Set. You know, his body was uh, separated into a number of different pieces and scattered. And then uh, Set, along with Tehuti and other divinities, found the pieces of the body and pulled the body together, mummified the body and so forth. Um, preserved the body, and then communicated with the spirit of the divinity. And when you see the great black one mummified, the body is preserved. That's the precursor to resurrection. You see the great black body of people who were thrown in the ships and so forth, thrown in the water, ended up in the Western Hemisphere, the land of the setting sun, 
the land where the sun dies and so forth, but this precursor to the resurrection, the black bodies were preserved or wrapped up, mummified in these white cotton fields and so forth. But eventually, Alset escapes from Set's rule. She goes into Northern committing the swamps and so forth. She conceives after connecting with the deceased body of Alsar, conceives with his spirit Heru in the swamps, and then Heru grows up to wage war and restore the nation. <clears throat> so our people, some of our people escaped, went into the swamps, into Dismal Swamp and other swamps and so forth, freed themselves, plotted rebellion, and waged war. Hold on one second. <clears throat> So that we go through that whole cosmology in the story, you can see the um, purification of the deceased body of the great black one being purified, precursor to resurrection and so forth. Once he's resurrected, he guides Hiteru and the warriors and warrior says to victory over said and the overthrow of the enemy and the restoration of the nation. And you also see the grains beginning to grow from the body of Alsar and so forth. That's showing that the, even though he was deceased and so forth, there was life within that body. Even though we were laid out on the plantations, a great black body of individuals laid out on the plantations and so forth and preserved in that white cotton, mummified in that white cotton on the plantations, there was a, there was life within that population. And once we tap into that source, that divine source and so forth, then we liberated ourselves freed ourselves and reestablished that sovereignty. Now, now, so that's what we say is Ojira Manu or Ojira Man, people of Ojira Man. We recognize the value of our individual functions in creation and their relationship and harmony with our collective function as Afurakanu Afraikaidut in the West and further as a component of the Afurakani Afraikaidi world body community. And as you will see, we have value in the world body community um, because of our interfacing with this enemy, the whites and their offspring. We can see certain things that I of Heru, you'll find that in the story of, um, um, in the cosmology, in order for Alsar to be resurrected, Heru gave him the eye. The eye of Heru is ultimately the eye of Ra and so forth. You'll see Heru saying, I give you this eye, the eye of Heru, that divine insight and so forth, that divine insight or illumination. And once that insight is given, then Alsar is resurrected. We have been given that eye of Heru because we function in accordance with order those of us who have done that and maintained that such religious practice, interfacing with this enemy, we can see certain things that some of our people just assume on the continent and other and elsewhere. They assume that the whites in our offspring must be doing something beneficial for them. We can see beyond that. Some of our people will blindly take these vaccines and so forth. The whites in our offspring will ship vaccines, whether it's COVID vaccines or quote unquote AIDS vaccines and all kinds of vaccines and medicines specifically to kill the people, specifically to make the people infertile, specifically to uh, develop degenerative diseases from babies all the way through adults. And some of them will blindly, those governments will blindly accept these vaccines and vaccinate their entire population. We can see beyond that because we know who this enemy is. We've been given that eye of Heru, which is ultimately the eye of Ra, eye of Rayat, and we've resurrected ourselves and we have that proper insight and we can give that kind of guidance as we're gonna see when we talk about these vaccines. Now, afashe means to celebrate a festival or establish and maintain a cultural or communal or ritual observance. Ojiramain afashe, Ojiramain festival or conference is the intersection of Afurakani, Afurakani ancestral religion 
culture, and nation building restoration. Now, we talk about the term nationism, the purification of nationalism. Ancestrally inherited wisdom, through that wisdom and guidance, we properly reestablish and re restore our own mind firmly grounded and rooted in our spirit genetic identity. So we're grounded in our divine function. We're, divine, we're, we're grounded in divine order. The great mother and great father was Aminet and Amen, called Nyamewa and Nyame and Akan, and Lisa and Mawu and um, Vodun, uh, Komosu and Chuku and Ibo, and Olokun, Olorun, and Yoruba, and so forth. The great mother and great father, the balance of male and female that permeates all of creation and so forth. When we align ourselves with that and our culture is built from that, then we make proper decisions. So, when we talk about Amanie, the term Amain once again means uh, nation. Amain is plural, Omain is singular, and so forth. <clears throat> so, Amai means nation. Ade or Adie means things or objects. Omain, Adie or Amandie. Amandie is defined as customs, traditions, or ways, meaning the things, Adie, of the Omain, of the nation. So Amandie means things of the nation. <clears throat> now, some people just say it's just customs or traditions or ways, which, which it is. But we utilize that term Amanie for nationism. It's rooted in the ancient term might, also meant, spelled meant in certain hieroglyphic dictionaries, but we can show that it's might. Mind means nature, kind, or manner. It means something which is firm, abiding, stand, position, stability, staying power, regularly, consecutively. When you see the Coptic dialectical variant of the term M-A-E-I-N is mine, just as it's pronounced in Akan, mine, the origin of the term monument, monumental, a monument, a pillar, a stele, and so forth. But the same word is mine, my new, a town, a city, but it's also mine, a monument, a pillar, a, a, a stele, a monument or monument, something that's established, that's fortified, that's you know, abiding, that's everlasting and so forth. So we talk about the Omain, a nation is a living, breathing entity with a spirit governing all who are component part. Just like the organs in your body, you have an organ and the cells are children of that organ, that living organ and so forth. And there's an energy um, component to that. We are children as cells within the great divine body of the Supreme Being, and the organs and glands within the great divine body are the Abosom, the, the Orisha, the Vodou, the deities. And they regulate order within the great divine body of the universe, the body of the Supreme Being, just like your organs regulate order in your great divine body. We are cells of the organs. When we serve our parent organ, then we're serving the whole body at the same time. So. When you have an organ, that's a collection of individuals working together in a harmonious fashion for a specific function or purpose. And our mind is a collection of individuals working together in a harmonious fashion for a specific function or purpose, but there's a spiritual force that governs that collective. It's a living, breathing entity, just like your organ is a living, breathing entity and so forth. And our mind and nation is a living, breathing entity. The various organs and glands in your body, like the liver and the spleen and the pancreas and so forth, those are miniature omine or miniature nations. And they have citizens, the cells, that work together to maintain that organ so you can maintain the entire body. Now, when we say that we, um, Nationism is properly expressed as Afurakani, Afurakani, African Black nationism is rooted in reality. When we adhere to the collective spirit of the Omain, the nation that governs us, that is Amanie, that is nationism. Nationism answers the questions of why Afurakanu, Afurakaitnu, possessing every skill set necessary to build, sustain, and defend an independent nation on our own territory, have not coordinated these skills and affected the desired result. Nationism 
Amanie breaks the impotence of secular, amorphous, or messianic nationalisms. You have secular nationalism is not grounded in a real philosophy. When we understand cosmology, which is rooted in our ancestral religion, alignment with the great mother, great father, supreme being, the deities and ancestral spirits and how they all work together to empower us. Just like you have your great body, then you have the organs, then you have the cells, and then you have the water system in the body that you know permeates the entire structure and they all work together to maintain the whole. When you have that same ph philosophy and understanding of creation and nation building, then you make proper decisions. If you have a secular nationalism where you're just talking about, hey, we just need to come together as a people and you're using some Eurocentric philosophy and so forth, the decisions that people make and what they value ultimately is guided by that white or secular philosophy. It's not harmonious and it dooms the uh, nationalistic effort from the beginning. The same thing with messianic nationalism where people just want a quote unquote divine leader to lead them to the promised land. That foolishness has never worked and it never was going to work. An amorphous nationalism where people are just doing whatever you know they feel drawn to do when they've been conditioned by white culture um, on the surface as well as unconsciously, that was never going to work and it hasn't worked in over a hundred years. Since people have been talking about nation building and nationalism and so forth over the past 100 plus years, we are no closer to having an independent sovereign black nation today than we were a hundred years ago. We're not getting close because we've embraced Eurocentric philosophies and tried to blacken them up and promote that as nationalism. This is why we talk about nationism, the purification of nationalism, understanding the foundation of what a nation actually is, what our roles in that component, you know, that uh, collective is as, as components of that collective, and then moving forward. And the only people who actually did that were those who adhere to ancestral religion and culture, and they freed themselves in their lifetimes, established independent sovereign settlements nations in their lifetimes and maintained them and defended them intergenerationally for hundreds of years up until the early 1900s and so forth. So we follow that example, not the failed examples of secular nationalism, messianic nationalism, amorphous nationalism. So this is why we say Nationism is born of our divine function as Afurakanu, Afuraikaidu, Africans in creation, and the unfolding of creation through our spiritual, familial, social, economic, and political life expressions. Nationism is the purification of nationalism. We have seven principal values of nationism that we deal with of Amanie. And we say Amaincesu, which means nation building restoration, number one methods of food production and preservation. If you're gonna be an independent nation, you have to have your own methods of food production and preservation. And we see how important that is. Of course, the whites and our spring uh, poison food, they utilize chemicals and so forth, uh, growth hormones, all kinds of things that are destructive specifically to melanin dominant people and so forth, our people. But that's waging warfare against us chemically. So we need to be independent, establishing our own methods of food production and preservation. Two, methods of curing disease, our own approach to curing diseases. We're gonna talk about root work, um, root medicine and so forth. And that's been, become very prominent over the past year. We've been talking about this for a number of years and our people have moved up on these um, issues. When we talk about nationism in our conference and so forth, we talk about those individuals within OGMI and the Purified Nation who are embodying each one of these principal values of nationism and showing what we have done and where we're moving forward. Our people have been dealing with methods of food production and preservation, for example, Mama Mawusi Ashakir and Baba Momtu and so forth. They presented at one of our um, nationism conferences and so forth, as well as the Echi Sign Conference. They've been dealing with food production and preservation as well as natural medicine for years. Um, methods of curing disease, same thing. Them as well as um, a number of people you, you've seen on our website or the broadcast that we've done. We have different individuals who are working in these areas, um, even producing products and so forth. Over the past year when people came down with this so-called virus and so forth, then they began to 
move in the direction of natural healing. The people who ridiculed the work that we were doing, ridiculed people who were having natural diets, ridiculing people talking about natural medicine and so forth for years. Once this worldwide so-called pandemic hit and 75% of the world is shut down, now those same individuals are reaching out to us. What were you saying about natural health? What were you saying? What should I take for this vaccine? I don't want to, or this, this so-called virus, I don't want to take this vaccine or even before the vaccine came out. People are coming down with these symptoms and so forth. They're trying to look for natural ways. Now they're coming back to us. who have been talking about root work and engaging in that for decades. Now that the vaccine has been released and they're making things mandatory in certain people's jobs and schools and so forth, now those same people who ridiculed the, the lifestyle, now they're coming to us to find out what they need to do to overcome these obstacles. Should they be sticking this needle in, the, in their arms, in the arms of their children, which is insane if you even consider that, knowing who this enemy is. <clears throat> this is why nationism is important. This is why culture is important. This is why truestory is important. When you understand truestory, understand cosmology, you know the nature of the whites in their offspring, all of them who exist, all of them who have ever existed, all of them who will exist until we make them extinct. They incarnate as spirits of disorder. So they only seek to consume and destroy like cancer cells seek to consume and destroy. They're never going to produce anything or provide anything that's for our benefit. Their goal is to consume and to destroy. So if they come forward and say, we have a vaccine, first of all, well, there's a worldwide pandemic and we're not sure where it came from. We already know immediately that they are behind the virus. No matter what form it takes, we already know they engineered it for that purpose. Number two, when they come forward and say, now we have the vaccine, we already know ahead of time before the evidence comes out that it's designed specifically to destroy the bodies of Afurakani, Afurakani people. That's the purpose. So we already know that from the jump. We don't have to engage in debate and wonder if they're trying to you know, assist our people. And then the evidence begins to come out. All you have to do is do a cursory research to find out that what they're releasing, what they're jabbing in people's arms and so forth and giving people free marijuana and free donuts and chicken and all kinds of nonsense trying to lure you into taking these vaccines. Why would they put so much emphasis on trying to get every black person vaccinated? They've never been focused on our health in the past. <clears throat> all of a sudden they're talking about vaccinations Free vaccinations are a component of racial justice, and this is a remedy, one of the remedies for racial, you know, injustice and so forth for Black people to get the vaccines first. Pure stupidity. But when you're grounded in your culture, your cosmology, your spirituality, your ancestral religion, and nationism, you know immediately that this is your enemy seeking to destroy you long term. When people start developing various forms of cancers in five or 10 years, all the people who took the vaccines, then you'll understand that we were on the right track the entire time. So this is why culture is important. This is why truestory is important. As we say in our, in our book, Patasa Satem, truestory, the seven principal values of She and Shebia. This is one of the modules when, within our Patasa Satem curriculum. Trustery, religion, judgment, maturity, revolution, resolution, relationship, sample, COFA protocol. We go through these different things, but when you understand trustery, religion, making proper judgments, you have maturity, you engage in revolution and resolution, the expansive and contractive poles of intelligence and so forth. You understand who the enemy is, what their role is, why they do what they do. Before you even get the evidence, you already know ahead of time and then you make proper decisions. You make proper decisions, not just in reaction to them, you make proper decisions all along the way. But then when you come in contact with what they're seeking, their agenda and what they're seeking to push on you, you already know ahead of time. Now, methods of food production and preservation, first principle value of Amani and nationism, methods of curing disease through root work, natural health, medicine and so forth, establishment of a military structure, we can't have an independent sovereign state and not establish a military structure simultaneously. That's part of our culture. 
And these seven principal values are connected to the abosom, the forces in nature that govern the seven day week with the third, third principal value governed by ben and Abana, the warrior and warrioress divinities, the immune and lymphatic systems within the great divine body and so forth. If you build a structure, you must build a defense for that structure. Your body is established and then you have an immune and lymphatic system that um, protects what has been established. That's, a, you know, that's put in place from the beginning. You establish a structure, whether it's a nation, whether it's a home, whether it's any kind of structure, you put a defense mechanism in place to preserve the structure that you just built. If you're foolish enough to believe that, well, if we just stay away from the whites and their offspring and build something, then as long as we stay away from them, they're going to stay away from us. You don't understand the nature of the achiwadi for the whites and their offspring, the spirits of disorder. As cancerous cells, anything they see with regard to us, they are going to seek to consume and destroy. That is their ill nature, and that will be their ill nature until we exterminate them. That's the only solution for the quote unquote race problem, their extermination. Now they're already, for example, the Western Eurasian is less than one tenth of the world population already. So all we have to do is accelerate their extermination and chemical and biological warfare on a mass scale is part of that process. We've been talking about that, that chemical and biological warfare can take out millions greater than tanks and bombs and so forth. We've been talking about that. We understand that with regard to Amani or nationism, our people didn't begin to realize that the truth in those statements and the books we've been publishing for years until last year, when they saw one hybrid virus shut down 75% of the world. That's more effective than flying some planes and some bombs and so forth and dropping different things. You have one virus that's, um, you know, sexually transmissible or is an airborne contagion and so forth, you can take out millions. That's why African governments, Afurakani, Afurakani governments, they have different, you know, departments and so forth. Just like the United States has the Center for Disease, Centers for Disease Control and the National Institute of Health and so forth. And part of that is a military structure where they work on chemical and biological warfare 24-7, 365. Every Afurakani, Afurakani government should have a department where they are working on chemical and biological warfare that attacks the DNA of the whites and their offspring. It has no ill effect upon us. That's the greatest weapon that can be utilized to wipe out our enemies. Every government on the continent should be working on that kind of research. And every Afurakani, Afurakani group here in the Western Hemisphere should be working on that as well. And many of our people have in the Hudu tradition, Juju tradition, Voodoo tradition, and so forth, root work and conjure are the um, precedent established for chemical and biological warfare in the West. And as we said in our previous presentation, last year in Ojidama and our people have been putting that work in all along. We have Hudu men and Hudu women, Juju men, Juju women, Voodoo men, Voodoo women, who work as nurses, as doctors, work in schools, work in hospitals, work in seniors' homes, work in the hospitality industry, and they've been putting that work in for years. So many people dying these various diseases and cancers and so forth, that's an effect of the work that our people have been putting in on these jobs. When you, you have a nice little nurse who seems very nice, nice little sister and so forth, you don't know that that's a hoodoo woman. You don't know the kind of root work that she's putting in. They're murdering our people on the streets, but then we're getting those people, those same people in the hospitals and seniors cares, senior care homes and everything else. So, and we talked about that in the previous, you can watch that um, broadcast from last year. So we must establish a military structure. Black Wall Street is, is an example of us establishing, you know, um, a settlement, a number of businesses becoming prosperous and so forth. We did not establish a military structure simultaneously. We were under the impression that if we stayed away from the whites and their offspring, that they might stay away from us. Our mindset was not, as we are building these businesses, we must build a military structure because we know that they're gonna come and seek to destroy and we need to be ready to exterminate them 
when they try. We weren't thinking like that. We were not only building insurance companies and, and doctor's offices and architectural firms and so forth, but we were building a lot of churches as well. Talking about forgiveness of our enemies and that kind of stupidity. Establishment of military structures, part of our ancestral religious culture. The institutionalization of our values, training institutions, educational institutions, industrial training, cultural in training, religious institutions and so forth. That's part of the nation building process, establishing sound systems of governance and jurisprudence so that when we, there are conflicts within the collective, within the Omai, we can mitigate disputes without um, the nation falling apart and warring against one another, building of homes on acquired land in our own territory, manufacturing of clothing. So these are the seven principal values of Amai Sesu nation building restoration that we adhere to rooted in our ancestral cosmology. Now, hold on a second. And one of the things that we show, just to give further context, from the Medu and sort of the hieroglyphic dictionary you see, Mine, once again, means a monument, a pillar, a town, or a city. But mine also means to twist, to turn around, curve, bow shape, but to twist, turn around. The same word that means a nation, a policy, or city. Mine, the same term that means a monument, is the same term, mine, that means to twist or turn around. When you look in the Akan language, once again, as we saw earlier, a mine the body of the inhabitants of a country, a nation, a people, a state. So that's the same thing, but you also have the term my to turn or go aside, to turn in somewhere from the way or journey. So just like mine and commit means to twist, to turn around, but also a town or city, mine also means to twist or to turn or to go aside, turn in, to twist or turn in, but it also means a nation. So when you look and it says to turn in and go somewhere. So what is the relationship between Omai meaning nation and Omai meaning to turn or twist or turn into somewhere. So if you're walking down a pathway and then you turn off the road and you see a collective of individuals working together in a harmonious fashion, you, you're walking and then you mine you twist or you turn or turn into somewhere, and then you're inside of a mine, a nation. If you look at your arteries, you see the blood vessels and so forth, the blood is traveling down a specific road, and then it turns off mine into a collective of individuals, an organ, which is a collective of cells working together harmoniously for a purpose. That's an oh mine, a nation. So you, the blood is going down a path, and then it turns a twist mind and ends up in an all mind. So that's the relationship between mind to twist and turn and mind meaning nation. When you turn off the road, you end up in a collective of individuals, you end up in an all mind. So, and once again, you have the same word with two different definitions in Akan. It is the very same word with the same two defini definitions in ancient Kanita Kemet. Just to prove that we continue that practice. Now, Now we just showed that uh, the relationship between the language and culture and cosmology between the Akan tradition and ancient Kanita and Kemet, but the same can be done with the Yoruba language and um, Igbo and various other languages as well. Now, in that context, since we're in this, you know, in the midst of this so-called pandemic, there's an intersection between ancestral religion and Nationism, of course, Amanie nationism, and is shown in a very poignant way with regard to this so-called pandemic. So let's switch up real quick. So this is the page for our Echisan Ancestral Religious Reversion Conference that we have, as we said, every year in March. 
We had the sixth annual conference. This year we did it. We, we normally do it in DC um, back in March or March 20th. Things were still shut down in DC and things are still shut down in DC. So we did this particular one um, in Atlanta this year. So this is why you see the flyer um, from March 20th when we're in Atlanta, but we typically do it in DC. But here's the document, etchy sign, official position against vaccinations and religious exemption affidavit. Now, people are getting back to work now. They're putting in place and school and schools and places of employment. Many of them are putting in place mandates, mandatory vaccinations, mandates for mandatory vaccination. So you can't return to work or you can't work at a specific place if you're not vaccinated. Um, you can't go to school, go back to college or go to school unless you're vaccinated. And they're trying to force people to become vaccinated. When you practice ancestral religion, you have a religious exemption, an ancestral religious exemption. The religious exemption exists and we claim that religious exemption. Number one, we're we're sovereign people. Nobody's going to just walk up to us and stick some, you know, chemical in our bodies because they said we need it. We'll kill them before we allow them to do that. So you're not going to do whatever you want to do. But when it comes to trying to force legally um, children as well as adults to receive this vaccination, we utilize and we claim the religious exemption. Now, first of all, let's look at what etchy sign is and why we utilize this umbrella term. So this is our journal, the Etchy Sign Conference in March. The first um, time we had the conference was in 13,016, so-called 2016. Um, and once again, we give away a, a journal um, each year. And the journal has different articles on Etchy Sign, Ancestry, Religious Reversion, and so forth. So in the introduction, we just explain what these terms are. As a matter of fact, let's switch over to the... Uh... And this, the one from 13,018. So in our con, the term etchi means back and sign means return. So etchi sign means to return back. That is a term for reversion. We don't deal with conversion. We don't convert people to ancestral religion. There's no such thing in reality. Only fake religions have to try to convert people because they're trying to convert them into a practice that's fraudulent from the beginning. Trying to make them believe in a fictional cartoon character named Jesus or Yeshua or a fictional cartoon character named Muhammad, or Yahweh, or Buddha, or Brahman, or Allah, or whatever these fictional characters are. None of them existed in any form or of any race whatsoever. And we've gone over that in our book, Kuku Tutsun, The Ancestral Jurisdiction. So the whites and Irishmen want to force you into a fake practice so you're following them and worshiping them. But when you have real religion, you can't convert anybody. We are born into our ancestral religion. We incarnate into our ancestral religion. We are assigned to specific abosom, marisha, vodou, divinities before we enter into the womb. And we carry that ancestral religion into our blood circle when we incarnate into the world. And that is for only for Afurakani, Afurakani African black people. So etchi sign, return back, is ancestral religion, not conversion, but reversion returning back to our original pristine state, returning back to the ancestral religion we inherited, that we inherited spirigenetically and carried on transcarnationally through successive rebirths or reincarnations within our metric plans and patric plans. So etchi meaning back and sign meaning return in Akan. Then we look in the language of ancient Kemet, this term vocalized as chi, to be behind someone, to follow, to march back, to turn back, to retreat, the hinder part, meaning back, 
cheat, and then sign to turn back, to return. So cheat, meaning back, and sign to return. In ancient Kemet, it's et chi, meaning back, and sign, meaning to return, and I come. So the et chi sign conference is Afurakani, Afurakani, African Ancestral Religious Reversion. We have our conference every year. We have presenters who deal with the voodoo tradition, which is Eve and phone, the hoodoo tradition, which is our Khan ancestral religion in North America, the juju tradition, which is Yoruba ancestral religion in North America, the Wanga tradition, which is Ovambo ancestral religion in North America, the Gola and Kisi traditions, which is Gola, Gola and Gichi, which is the Gola people and the Kisi people of West Afrika, Afrika. It's called Gola and Gichi in North America, it's Gola and Kisi on the continent and so forth. We deal with those expressions of ancestral religious practice that we preserved in our blood circles, spirit genetically here in the Western Hemisphere over the past 300 plus years. We don't have people come from, you know, Nigeria who are Baba Laos and come and talk about the Yoruba tradition. They have conferences for that. We don't have Akan people from Ghana who come over here and talk about how the Akan religion is practiced today in contemporary Ghana. They already have conferences for that. We are dealing with our ancestral religious practice that we preserved from the continent, maintained it in our blood circles here, and as it um, shifted in form, because as we said before, we interacted with this region of the Earth Mother's body and incorporated that energy into our new expression. We have our own unique expression of ancestral religion. The hoodoo man and hoodoo woman is the priest and priestess, the juju man and juju woman is the priest and priestess, the voodoo man, voodoo woman is the priest and priestess. We've maintained our ancestral religions intact, including the priesthoods, priestesshoods for hundreds of years. When you communicate with your ancestresses and ancestors and the divinities, you cannot lose culture when you can communicate with those and be possessed by those who establish culture. So we have our own conference for our own ancestral religion that we've preserved. Now, one thing we want to show in this particular book actually, yes. And to show a cultural continuity We talked, we have an entire book talking about the term Undu in ancient Kanetika Meta is the term Undu in Akan and Hudu in North America and so forth. So we touched on that here in this article. <clears throat> and we show all the relationships and so forth. But then we also show that The term juju is from the Yoruba language, from the root ju, which means to cast or to throw, talking about casting medicine or casting energy and so forth. Yoruba people popularly call their Yoruba ancestral religion the juju religion in North America, from the Yoruba term juju. So that identified their ethnic group. When you said, I'm a juju man, a juju woman, you were saying, I'm a Yoruba man, a Yoruba woman. If you said, I'm a hoodoo man, a hoodoo woman, you were saying, I'm an Akan man, an Akan woman. You said, I'm a voodoo man or voodoo woman. <clears throat> You're expressing your ethnic group. You're saying, I'm an uh, Eve man or Eve woman. <clears throat> if you said, I'm casting the Wanga, I'm a Wanga man or Wanga woman in North Carolina and so forth. You're saying, I'm an Ovambo man, Ovambo woman. We were identifying our ethnic group and we preserved our ethnic identity for hundreds of years through our ancestral religion. So <clears throat> you see the term with the open palm pronounced um, do or Ju, you see it here, Ju in H. Gamet. Sometimes I talk about Juju as something bad or evil, and you see that there's a connotation, bad or evil, but in reality, um, <clears throat> the term Do means to give. You see the arm with open palm, handing the loaf of bread and so forth. Givers, but it's, it's transferring something. See so here, Jui, meaning to cry out or to call, meaning ritual invocation. Jua, to pray, to praise, to address, to make a report, to honor. That's a ritual provocation. You see the hands up in the ritual prayer formation. 
that is projecting energy in a ritual, invocatory, or provo provo provocatory or invocatory form. <clears throat> So that's why you see the two hands up and so forth. And you also see the man with the stick and so forth, driving and so forth. But that is ritual provocation, pushing or releasing that energy. That is projection, that is throwing, that's Jew or Jew out to throw, to release, to provoke energy in a ritual context. And that's why they show the open palms in that context. So we go into detail about that. Many, Jew meaning to cast or throw in Yoruba, Juju, and the same thing with Jew or Jua in ancient Kemet, same piece. The term Grigri, a Bambara term. So if you hear somebody say they're a Grigri man, a Grigri woman, and so forth, that's a Bambara term, a Mindi term, but a Bambara term, and so forth in North, North America, the Mindi ethnic group. And you talk about Grigri bags and so forth, but what you have is Gere, Gere. When they say you have the Gri Gri and you use that to destroy the enemy and so forth, the Mendi ancestral religion, Bambara ancestral religion became identified with the use of the Gre Gre, which they use as medicine to destroy the enemy and so forth and empower themselves to wage war against the whites and their offspring. <coughs> You'll see Gere means burnt sacrifice offering, that's, and Gere, Gera means a strip of cloth or a rag and so forth. That is the gri gri bag. Gere, gere, or gri gri bag that goes back to ancient Kanid and Kemet is still utilized in the language of the people today. You see gri gri bags here. <coughs> Excuse me, you'll see the same kind of, you know, patch or a pouch worn by a Bambara hunter on the continent. But we continue to make these gri gri bags and so forth. The phone and Ebe people practicing Vodun. We show that Dune means a rising flood, inundation, and so forth. Um, but the U and the V and the W interchange, you will find that in European languages as well as Afurakani, Afurakani languages. So you'll see, for example, the Ovambo people, it's also pronounced Owambo, Owambo, O U A M B O, Owambo, or O V A M B O, Ovambo. You hear Ewe, Ewe, but then also Eve, Eve. So just like in European languages, you'll see Sweden, or they'll say Sweden, the W and the V interchange and so forth. This spelling here meaning existence, things that exist and so forth, but then also the name of a divinity, the name of male divinity, female divinity, also to do a wrong, commit a sin, defect, error, and so forth. The, it's not unu, it's wonu, Wonu, Wonu in ancient command is Vonu in Eve and Phone, that Wonu became Vonu or Vodu, and it's dealing with the priests who served in courses, priests of the hour, lay servants of a temple, and so forth. It's the name of a male and female divinity. It also has to do with existence. It's spelled with the um, hair, <coughs> hair or a rabbit and so forth. And we know about the rabbit's foot and all of that. But we go into detail showing that unu as vocalized is wonu, wonu, and vonu. Vonu became vodu in Ewe language and phone language and so forth. And still dealing with those same divinities, the same function of being or existence divine being, divine existence. The term Vodou um, or Voodoo means a deity, just like Orisha means a deity in Yoruba, Aboso means a deity in Akan. Vodou means a deity, a spirit force in creation, a divinity, 
in the Evean phone language. And they just call it the entire tradition, Vodou and so forth, that comes from Wonu, a being, of divine, a divine being of existence and so forth, also related to the priests and priestesses. And we go into detail about that. We just want to touch on that real quick. And the same thing with Wanga. <clears throat> As we mentioned, Ovambo people live in primarily northern Namibia, southern Angola, also written Owambo. And the W can also be a U. So instead of O W O Wambo, it will be O U O Wambo. But O Wambo or O Vambo, the V sound and the U sound are interchangeable. Just like in Wonu or Vonu, which became Vodu, it's the same thing here. But the term Wanga. When you hear about the woman cast the wanga, meaning casting the spell or casting the medicine, that is from the, the term wanga, also spelled owanga, can be found in the Ovambo language as owanga. Among various Niger Congo speakers, the term takes various forms wanga, owanga, owanga, bwanga with a B, ovanga. So you hear the wanga man and the wanga woman. And we go into some detail to show that that all anga um, is a onga, which became oanga. And you'll see one of the, you know, ritual pieces and so forth associated with the people in the Congo as well as Angola and so forth. The spikes of the pigs ritually inserted for ritual purposes. Hold on one second. So this onga, onga became owanga in Namibia and so forth amongst the Obambo people. And you'll see to nail, to drive pegs into something, to beat, to hammer and so forth. An offering of some kind, bolts, nails, metal pegs. So when they're talking about ritual offerings and utilizing nails and metal pegs and driving them into something and it's on onga, onwanga and so forth, this is where we get that term from. It's a term from the Avambo language. Very often they'll say, well, wanga just means witchcraft. Just like they'll say voodoo means witchcraft or hoodoo means witchcraft or juju means witchcraft. Utilizing that energy in a ritual fashion to wage war against the enemy. So we defined our traditions based on, on that aspect of our practice. So hoodoo, juju, voodoo, wanga, and so forth. But as you can see, the same ritual practice of anga, driving nails into the ritual sculpture and so forth, casting medicine, um, still utilized as driving nails in the ritual sculpture today and casting medicine and so forth, and it's called wanga or vanga. Now, or a wanga. And then you have the Fang people, in Gabon and Equatorial Guinea and Cameroon, um, Republic of Congo in the West, Western Central Afrika, Afrika, the term Ngengai amongst the Fang is Nganga amongst others in West and Central Afrika, Afrika, so whether it's Nganga or Ngengai and so forth, you find that. We were talking about the term ki in fang means divine living energy. The same term is ki or chi in Asia Kemet. Chi or ki meaning exalted one, the winged disc, but um, kai or ki or chi, the exalted one, a title of ra. So whether it's chai or chi or ki, pronounced different ways, the exalted one, the title of ra. This is why ki means divine living energy in Fang is where you get Qi, meaning divine living energy or Qi. In Asia, they stole that from a title of Ra and so forth. In fact, Rei Qi, Rei meaning universal and Qi meaning energy. Qi comes from 
K, which is Kai, a title of Ra, the divine living energy operating through the solar disk and so forth. That's the divine living life force energy of Ra, whose name is corrupted to Ray by Europeans. So Ray doesn't just mean universal, it's a corruption of Ra and Ki is a title of Ra. So they even stole the term Reiki from the titles of the creator of the universe. <clears throat> Here in ancient Kamek, Gangan or Gengai, or the great goose who laid the egg from which Ra would be born and Ra'et would be born and so forth. Gangan or, this is not neg, neg or, it's not actually Nganga, Nganga or the great Nganga. And that's the title of the great goose, the great gander, who was the great animal totem, sacred animal totem of Amen and Amenet. When they cackled at the beginning of creation and released the ga, ga sounds in the primordial waters, life force energy was born and creation began to move and so forth. The great Nganga, the Ganga or the great Nganga, as is properly vocalized here, a title of Amen and Amenet, the Nganga, the one who releases the ritual incantations, the sound vibrations, the great goose who spoke at the beginning of creation, the great gander released those cackles that set creation in motion. The priests and priestesses in the Fang tradition, as well as the Bakango tradition and so, and so forth, call themselves Nganga or Nganga, which means to ritually invoke, ritual incantations. So we're using the same terms. And that's the in gang gang or gang gang and so forth. And now you hear people saying gang gang and gang and so forth. But that in gang gang culture, that gang culture comes from that in gang gang culture in the Fang tradition, in ganga or in ganga amongst the Bakongo and so forth. So the reason why we repeat certain words, we're drawn to certain words and so forth is because there's a ritual context to them. The ones that we, we're drawn to and that we hold on to and utilize in certain ways is because they come from our language. Now, in our Hoodoo Mind, Hoodoo Nation Festival Journal, The term kanche, an akan term, is the origin of the term kanje, which in North America, which became conjure, pronounced conjure and so forth. But it is the akan term kanje. So when we say I'm a kanche man, a kanje woman, kanje man, kanje woman, the Europeans would say, oh, they're trying to pronounce conjure. And they're just saying kanje. But we were saying kanche, which means ritually invoking the spirits and so forth. So we show the origin of that term in North America, root work in kanje. It's not root work in conjure, it's root work in kanje, and it's root work in kanche. So we were utilizing an akan term, just like undu or hudu is an akan term, so is kanje an akan term. And that's directly related to these vaccinations and so forth. So, kanja or kanje. Hold on a second. So, in the Asante Fanti Dictionary, the Akan Dictionary, you see kanche to pray, rehearse, speak a prayer, to evoke or call upon, they'll say a fetish, but that means a divinity and so forth. That's what kanche means. Prayer, invocation, kanche to make a sign with straighter curved lines. That also has to do with ritual divina divinatory marks and so forth, but ritual invocation. And the reason why it means prayer invocation is because ka, to emit a sound, to utter, to speak, to say or tell. And che means to bring forward as in the coming forward of the sun at sunrise. So ka in the Akan language means to emit a sound, to utter, speak, say or tell. That's important because 
kai in it you commit. Also pronounced ka means to think, to think out, to speak, to say, cry out, to tell out. So the same word in akan meaning to emit a sound, to speak, say, or tell, ka, but ka, you find ka in it you commit, to speak, to say, to cry out, to tell out. Ka, to surrender oneself to a fetish meaning a divinity or patron spirit and so forth. Ka also is a term for soul. Now, Che means to be become clear or visible, to appear, come to light, to come or bring forth, to obtain or impart subsistence. Usually only used in connection with Adie, the day breaks, things become visible. Che or Ache, a salutation, greeting, especially in the morning. Ma, Ache means I, I bid you dawning. Ache means the coming forth of the sun. To become visible, become clear, come to light. <clears throat> Ache, the coming forth of the sun. And that's how we greet one another in the morning. Ma, Che, I give. Ma, Ache, dawning, coming into being the invisible power that was in the underworld, the solar energy. It comes from the underworld and manifests in the physical world and the landscape is illuminated, but you're also empowered. When you bring that force that was in the underworld to the physical world, you become empowered and you become illuminated. That's what Che means. In H. Gamet, Che means to rise like the sun or like a king on his throne to ascend, to shine, to appear. And this medut is the sun with the little rays shooting out the sun, just rising above the horizon, halfway above the horizon, the rays begin to shoot out. So che is the coming forward of the sun, becoming clear, becoming visible, to rise like the sun and so forth, the light manifests. So ka means to speak, say, or tell. Che means the coming forward of the sun. Kan, che, and akan means to speak, to say, or tell, utter incantations, ka, to bring the spirits forward, just like the spirit, the divine living energy of the sun, that solar fire, that superpower that's in the underworld, when it rises up, che, it illuminates and empowers. When we engage in kan, che, we utter incantations to make the spirits, ka, to make the spirits come forward, become visible, illuminate, and empower, che. So the term kan, che, is broken down to those two components. It comes directly from the language of ancient Kemet, as we've just proven. It does not come from the English term conjure. It comes from the ancient term ka che, a, comb a combined term, a compound term. And our con people still speak that term, the same words with the same meanings. And then in North America, we still say kanje, kanje man, Kanje woman, we're talking about a Kanche man, a Kanche woman. So we go into detail about that in that particular article. The reason why that's important is because when people ask you about your religious exemption, when you go to work or you go to school and so forth, we've given this form, it's the philosophical foundation, as well as we added the affidavit at the end just a couple of weeks ago. This is the affidavit you can print out. I write your name and claiming the religious exemption to the COVID vaccination as provided by Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. And then we cite the relevant statute and the relevant section. Employer practices, it shall be unlawful and unlawful employment practice for an employer Number one, to fail or refuse to hire or to discharge any individual or otherwise to discriminate against any individual with respect to his compensation, terms, conditions, or privileges of employment because of such individuals' race, color, religion, sex, or national origin. Or number two, to limit, segregate, or classify his employees or applicants for employment in any way which would deprive or tend to deprive any individual of employment opportunities or otherwise adversely affect 
his status as an employee because of a such an individual's race, color, religion, sex, or national origin. And then it says, I affirm that vaccinations of any kind are contrary to my sincerely held religious beliefs. When you state that you have a sincerely held religious belief, then um, if they try to you know, discriminate against you based on that, then they are violating the statute. And the reason why this statute <clears throat> the reason why this statute um, or this Title VII from the Civil Rights Act can even exist is because it goes back to the Constitution, the you know, freedom of religion, the First Amendment, and so forth, the Bill of Rights. Um, and in fact, just pull that up real quick. Let me just pull that up real quick. Okay. Now, as you can see here, <clears throat> First Amendment of the Bill of Rights says Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or the right of people to peaceably assemble, peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for redress of grievances. But the key is the established, the Congress can't make a law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, thereof. So that's what they call the establishment clause and the free exercise clause within the constitution. If someone says that in order for you to work here, you must um, take this vaccination and you say, well, vaccinations are against my religion, which they actually are. Um, if they say, well, you still have to take it, then they're violating um, the free exercise clause within the First Amendment because you're not allowed to freely exercise your religion. If they say, well, that's not a real religion, then they're trying to establish what a real religion is and they're in violation of the constitution. They can ask you, hey, what is your religion about? You, you really don't have to give them that. Um, you don't have to give them the tenets of your religion. They can ask for it and some of them will try to bully you into it. But if they ask you for the tenets of your religion or some explanation um, and then you give them that, if they were to try to say, well, that doesn't constitute a religion. They're in violation of the constitution. There's a great deal of case law that proves that. Because anytime they say, well, that doesn't constitute a religion, they've just violated the first amendment by trying to establish a religion. If you say something is not, or doesn't constitute a religion, then you just place yourself in a position to establish what real religion is and what real religion is. Someone can wake up in the morning and say, I have a new religion, I have a new deity, and they told me I'm, I'm against vaccinations. That is a legitimate religion according to the law. And of course, the religions that the whites and our spring practice are all fake anyway. So now, so we have this affidavit it can be used for schools as well as work, but we also give a philosophical foundation so you don't have to waste much time. If you would like to give this to them, um, you can do that because typically they try to bully certain people with, but when they see that you have um, you know, a document and you have some information, they don't want to cause too many problems because it, it can start something that turn into a court case. It can turn into, you know, you posting it online and they be becoming, you know, going viral and so forth. But we have an official position against vaccinations and the religious exemption affidavit. Echi sign is descriptive of the ritual culture of Afurakani, Afurakani people, African Black people, African ancestral religion, in North America, when Afurakanu, Afurakaitnu, Africans and Black people were forced into North America during the enslavement era, we continue to engage our ancestral religious expressions. All Afurakani, Afurakaitnu, African ancestral religious practices have the same fundamental cosmological foundation 
We align our thoughts, intentions, and actions with the great mother and great father, supreme being, through the agency of the deities and our spiritually cultivated ancestresses and ancestors. So ancestral religion is the ritual incorporation of divine law, the ritual restoration of divine balance. Through ritual, we incorporate those things, objects, deeds, and entities we need to incorporate in order to align our thoughts, intentions, and actions with divine order. And through ritual, we reject those things, objects, deeds, and entities we need to reject in order to restore balance to our thoughts, intentions, and actions and restore um, our lives with divine order. So the ritual incorporation of divine law and the ritual restoration of divine balance are the expansive and contractive poles of ancestral religion. So, now, we say while this fundamental cosmological structure is consistent throughout Afurakani, Afurakani African Black communities, wherever we exist in the world, our expressions of this structure are unique. And we talked about that earlier with regard to, you know, different languages, diff different ritual forms of dance, ritual forms of prayer, ritual forms of song, ritual forms of chant, ritual food preparation, ritual medicine preparation, ritual observances, ritual clothing, ritual architecture, ritual shrines, ritual arts, and so forth. And we talked about earlier how since we were forced to migrate to this region of the earth, we still align with this region of the earth mother's body. We may be in the Western Hemisphere, the political structure is, you know, criminal. But the region of this earth mother's body, the earth mother is a divinity, that's divine. So when we're on a region of her body, the fertile earth mother's body and so forth, when we come to this particular region, we align with the unique expression of energy emanating from this region of her body and we align with that through spirit possession and spirit communication. So as we said earlier, our culture slightly changes, just like our diet changes when we have Echinacea, we have other fruits and vegetables that exist here that don't exist there. Our diet changes, our culture changes. When we're in the wintertime, we do certain things and we operate certain ways that are different than we did when we were on the continent at the same time of year. But also our religious ritual practices are changed slightly. So we have unique expressions of ancestral religion in North America over the past 300 years. So we say various eth ethnic groups continued our ritual practices under names within our very languages. We just talked about this. Hudu from the Akan term, Undu. Akan ancestral religion in North America, Juju from the Yoruba term, Juju. Yoruba ancestral religion in North America, we just talked about Vodou, we talked about Wanga, Grigri, and so forth. So we preserve our ethnic group identity through these names and ritual practices. In our various related traditions, what is known as conjure and root work are central to our religious practice. So in English, they'll say people practicing Wanda, Wanga, Voodoo, Grigri, Hudu, Juju, and Gengai, and so forth. Those are root workers. Those are conjure men, conjure women. And that's all true. We all have our own terms for that. But it's all part, it's part of our culture. The expansive and contractive poles of ancestral religion, as stated above, are the ritual incorporation of divine law that is expansive when you incorporate things and expand. And then the ritual restoration of divine balance. That's the contract. Something goes wrong and you attack, you know, the criminality. You attack the cancerous cells. You attack the enemy, expel them so you can restore balance. You incorporate things so you can expand. You can track to force the corruption out. When you consume food, you expand, you grow, you develop, but then you contract, you eliminate waste and you force waste out of the body. It's expansion and contraction consumption and elimination, inhalation, exhalation, incorporation and restoration. The contractive pole of ancestral religion, the restoration of divine balance is there where in conjure and root work for the purpose of healing is manifest. So through conjure or conche and root work, we ritually provoke the energy of the spirits of plant life, mineral life, animal life and human life to restore balance, to heal ourselves from all illnesses be they physical or spiritual, that's emotional, mental, psychological imbalance as well. The ritual approach is rooted in employing the four elements of fire, water, earth, and air, which are governed by male and female deities, divine spirit forces in creation, who animate the sun, moon, stars, planets, black substance of space, oceans, rivers, earth, 
atmosphere of mountains and more. These deities are called hoodoo spirits, juju spirits, voodoo spirits, wanga spirits, and more in the very cultures, depending on who you, you're dealing with. Um, we are directed by the great mother and great father, supreme being, amen, amen and amen, to align with their children, the deities, via spirit possession and spirit communication, to extract from plant life, animal life, mineral life, and human life the necessary elements and energy to restore balance, to heal ourselves. This extraction from plant life and animal life and mineral life and human life guided by the deities is further guided by our spiritually cultivated ancestresses and ancestors through spirit possession and spirit communication to fit our specific spirit genetic blood circle. So while a Yoruba person may extract certain plant life, you know, elements from plant life to heal their people, well, our Khan person, based on our genetic makeup, we have to utilize the same plant life in a different fashion. So that's guided by our ancestresses and ancestors of our specific blood circle. What do people in our blood circle need to fortify ourselves as opposed to a different blood circle? So spirit possession from the deities to extract that energy from plant life and animal life and mineral life and so forth. But then the guidance by the ancestral spirits on how to uniquely utilize that for your specific um, Matric clan or Patrick clan group that they will want to and still are a part of. So we say producing herbal and, metal, and mineral medicines to address all illness through the ritual methodology of conjure and root work is a critical component of our ancestral religious practice as it is our duty to obey the directives of the great mother and great father supreme being. Vaccinations produced and distributed by those who have enslaved our people and continuously discriminate against our people is not in alignment with nor expressive of the divine authority that we adhere to. So we say the ancestral religious expressions in North America, African-American ancestral religion or Echi Sign, under the umbrella of Echi Sign, inclusive of Hudu, Juju, Voodoo, Wanga, and Gengai, Grigri, Gola, Kisi, which is Galangichi, and Ganga, Bakango, Kemeti, so-called Kemetic ancestral, ancient Egyptian, and so forth, and all others adhere to the same divine mandate. So through Echi Sign, ancestral religious reversion, we, this is our this year made our sixth annual conference, our Echi Sign conference. So we've documented over the past six years, as well as in our film, um, that we have the Echi Sign movement, ancestral religion in North America, the various traditions under one umbrella, and they have the same divine mandate. We practice our own individual traditions, but we are united um, organizational-wise under the same cosmological umbrella. So we say we who embody these religious expressions govern every aspect of our lives in accordance with these principles. Our ancestral religion animates our ancestral culture. Our object objections to vaccinations of our children and adult population not only fall under the protection of religious exemptions to vaccinations as put forward in federal and state law, but also under our natural goddess God-given right to reject anyone seeking to inject our bodies with substances that they have deemed necessary for us, irrespective of our aversion to them. And then we bold this, we will not allow anyone to inject chemicals into the bodies of our children or adult population against our will. So that's that foundation for that. And then we have the religious exemption. So as we said earlier, those who have, you know, were dismissive of ancestral religion, inclusive of this dismissive of ritual practice and root work and conjure and so forth. Ever since last year, those people who are dismissive are coming to us asking, what were you saying about root work? What were you saying about herbs? What were you saying about medicine? because their people are dying, the Europeans who created the virus are not healing them. Of course, they release, you know, the little hybrid to kill people anyway, but really to create a hysteria because they fudge the numbers and so forth. They'll lie about the number of people dying and inflate the numbers to create this hysteria. And once you have this hysteria, you're begging them for a vaccine. You're begging them to inject you with chemicals that will actually develop cancer within you years down the road. But the only way they can get millions of black people to beg them, white so-called supremacists, which are inferior, 
inferior inferiorists in reality because they can never be supreme. But the only way you can get your enemy, the only way they could get millions of black people to come to them and beg them, can you please stick some chemicals in my arm that will kill me and my children, is to make the black people believe that there's a worldwide pandemic, millions of people are dying, you better get a vaccination or you might die and so forth. And then we stand in line to get chemicals injected in our arms that they created ahead of time before the even pandemic was released. This is a form of genocide, an approach to genocide. So, <clears throat> so for us, of course, we have our <clears throat> natural aversion. We're not letting anybody put chemicals in our bodies, <clears throat> period. The whites in our spring, <clears throat> excuse me, the whites in our spring incarnated spirits of disorder. They are our enemies. So anything that they ever put forward as, you know, something for us, we already know is against us. Of course, if you do the research, you'll find that out. You can do the research even with what they publish, but we need to do our own research. We're not just dependent on them because they lie about their own research. Even the whites and their offspring who claim to be dissenters and they're going against the status quo and pretending like they're, you know, exposing the conspiracy and so forth. They work along with the graphics who put the virus ahead in the, in the first place because you follow the little white dissenters and the white quote unquote ones who are quote unquote conspiracy advocates and the ones who are cracking the code and so forth, then when they give you a, <clears throat> a, you know, a solution to the conspiracy, which is actually devastating for you, you go along with it because you think that they were fighting against the status quo. <clears throat> Crackers are never fighting against the status quo in reality. Hold on one second. <clears throat> We have our, <coughs> excuse me, <clears throat> we, have our, we have our own, you know, approach to research. We have our own ancestral religious practice. Through divination, we can find out what, what needs to be done. <coughs> excuse me. We find out what needs to be done, what we need to, how we need to approach any situation in life. Our ancestral religious practice and culture addresses every issue that can possibly confront us. You don't have a real culture, inclusive, animated by ancestral religion, if it doesn't answer every question that can manifest every issue, every possibility, every potential. When you have a real ancestral religion and culture, it answer, answers every question imaginable. We're not dependent on our enemies for answers. We have it within our own culture, mechanisms within our own culture to address every obstacle placed before us. Okay. Hold on one second. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so that is the information I wanted to share today. I just wanted to um, go into some detail about giving that cosmological uh, context for this piece and showing the intersection between uh, nationism and ancestral religion and so forth. If you have any questions, of course, you can post some in the chat room or if you want to unmute yourself, if you had a question, you can do that. You can look in the chat room for the links to these books that we and the document that we posted. Let me see, one second. And we, we um, you see our etchy sign page, that's what the document is. So. So um, just as a update also, what we have done over the past, year with, with, within Ojira Mind, these are the things that we have been building upon. So if you recall, we said that
within the seven principal values of Amani nationism, which, which is inclusive of Amai and Sesu nation building restoration, methods of food production and preservation, methods of curing disease, establishment of military structure, institutional, institutionalization of values, establishing training, educational, industrial, cultural, and religious institutions, establishing sound systems of governance and jurisprudence, buildings of building of homes on acquired land in our own territory, manufacturing of clothing. So we have individuals working in these various seven areas of Amani nation building and so forth. Um, for example, over the past year, since everything took place with regard to the, you know, so-called pandemic and so forth, we have individuals, when you look on our website, you'll see, and you'll see when you look on our, you know, social media pages and so forth, we post these individuals, people have developed, you know, natural medicines with regard to overcoming the whole COVID piece. Of course, the vaccine does not cure anything. It also does not prevent you from, you know, being infected. So they're telling you to get a vaccine. Of course, it won't cure you from anything and it won't prevent you from getting infected. And they quote unquote have no cure for the virus. But our people who utilize natural medicine and so forth, they, for example, the sister um, Bas Tefnu Ra, who has the Menguilie herb and so forth, which is very effective against that upper respiratory infection, and a number of different individuals using natural medicine to overcome the disease. But then you also, we also have this religious exemption and so forth and the philosophical foundation, which thousands of our people will be able to utilize this form so they won't be discriminated against again on their job, or when the people try to do that, they have, you know, some, um, some backup. Because if they do move forward and try to, you know, um, force the people out or, you know, create disturbances for them on the job front, they can go viral, they can file a lawsuit, they can do a number of different things. So we've also, in the area of the institutionalization of our values, and we, we have this on our website and so forth, our Obedima Afurakani Manhood 13-week training and the Oba Tine. And let's go to those pages real quick so you can see. So our sister Ama Asinye Mati, she just completed teaching the 13 week, the first 13 week Obatain Sem Afurai Kaitni African Black Womanhood course based on our book Obatain Afurai Kaitni Womanhood, African Black Womanhood, and so forth. She took a number of sisters through that 13 week training intensive, going over the Obatain book, but also other books um, written by Afurai Kaitni women as well, women as well. Um, as well as the Patas Asatim curriculum. So she just took people through that, just completed that 13 week course. That 13 week course will come again, um, most likely in the uh, autumn session. So that'll be coming up. We took um, Afurakani Man through the Oberima Sem Afurakani Manhood course, 13 week course. Based on our book, Oberima Afurakani Manhood, we also have the Patasa Sistem curriculum book as well as other books that we've published and so forth. We went through that information, but we took um, two segments of Afurakani Man in the fall session and the winter session for that 13 week intensive, transforming our people fully grounded in Afurakani Manhood and so forth. Now, hold on one second, pull this up. And we also have our brother Kojo Jojo Mati, <clears throat> who established the Heru Core. So that's Obedima manhood training for youth from the ages 10 to 17. So he takes them through Obedima Afurakani manhood book and so forth. You see these are the seven principal values of manhood from the book. This is website Heru Core. 
So JoJo's doing that with the with the young males. Then I take I'm doing the course for men from you know 17 and up. Um, our sister Ama is doing the course for women, you know, 17 and up from into el elderhood and so forth. And then our sister Amit is gonna be working on the adolescents, the young women from 10 years old to 17. So we're covering all age ranges. This is the first time that we put these, this past year is the first time we put the 13 week courses together. Now we've taught, you know, we put the manhood book out a number of years ago, back in 08. We put the womanhood book out as a collective. We put that book out um, a few years ago in 13,017. So we've been teaching, you know, uh, manhood and womanhood and so forth in different contexts for a number of years. But this is the first time we have 13 week courses for the women, 13 week courses for the men, and then also for the youth. So. Okay, so that's just some of the um, things that we've done. And we're also, uh, going to have some new publications coming out this summer, some new books coming out this summer. So you're going to be on the lookout for that. Okay. Just wanted to make sure there was nothing else in the chat room. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and end it here. It's 12, 12. Um, we want to say yeda, say thank, we thank everybody for joining in. We are going to um, upload this to the Ojira Mind page. So we're going to save the video, edit the video, upload it to the page. So th for those who missed or if you want to go through the information once again, uh, you will be able to um, check out the video. And um, be on the lookout for, you know, we're going to have a number of books being released, a few books being released this summer. So that's coming up. Um, check us out on social media, Ojira Fo on Instagram. Kwesi Akan, as well as Ojira Akan on Facebook, will be having those updates as well. Uh, hello. Yes. Uh, the question that I wanted to ask you was saying about the affidavit. Uh, is there something that uh, we can get for Tisfahain uh, affidavit when you was talking about the religion? Uh, which I'm around a lot of people, they have religions so different, saying from what I've heard. You explain, so say like the Christianity, they say they have the true religion and which we, I know that's not true. Right. Now, now the first question you said was, now you can download that form. Um, okay. And that's on the, let me show you the page. You can download the form, you can print it out. Okay. So this is the actual page, but when you click on the, this is the Etchy Sign page right here. But when you click on it, click on the image, the four page document shows up. Okay. And the final page, the final page is the form. So that's okay. the form you can utilize. Now, if they, some jobs will say, okay, fine. Then other jobs may say, well, you know, can you share with me some of the tenets of your religion or something? If you want to, you can do that. You can you can share with them, you know, the first three pages if you want to. Okay. I uh, say, like for instance, you have some uh, like my surrounding that I am. They don't believe. They believe what their Christianity is the true religion, and then you go and you don't want to go into where that. Uh, where an argument come in at and they look at you like that you don't know the true religion. So I have a lot and know a lot that have taken that shot and saying that shot was not very good. And they're like that since they took the shot, you became com contaminating just standing by them. Right. That, or the that, saying that you, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, well, you, you were saying that um, <clears throat> the people who took the shot and that there's a such thing as, you know, viral shedding. So when people take the mm -hmm. shot and those chemicals are inside their body and, you know, they begin to release, um, you can be impacted ne negatively just by being in the presence of somebody who were releasing these chemicals from their own 
bloodstream. So you can become okay. negatively impacted by someone who took the shot themselves. Oh, okay. So it's not really good to be around them that take it a shot where it'll cause you be infected. Yeah, it can, like one sister, for example, she, she's, she does, you know, hair, natural hair and so forth. And she posted this on mm -hmm. Instagram. She has a business and she made a post. She was like, I'm sorry, but for, for now and indefinitely, I will not be taking clients who have been vaccinated because she oh, noticed okay. like her and other people doing hair noticed that they had irregular um, periods and things like that when they were working with people who've been vaccinated because of that viral shedding that happens when people get those chemicals in their bodies and so forth. It causes a negative impact physiologically on people who are around it. Just like if you secondhand smoke, somebody's smoking and they're, you, know, you just happen to be standing in the room you're not smoking, but because they are smoking, they're releasing those chemicals, you end up breathing it in and then it affects you negatively as well. So okay. the same thing can happen. So we, first and foremost, we need to empower ourselves, build up our immune systems, have a proper diet, take the kind of cleansing herbs we need to take so we can always be you know, on guard against anything that's coming forward, whether it's that or any other virus or any, anything else. Our immune systems can handle that if we, you know, support our immune systems with proper diet and, you know, herbs and exercises. So, okay. so the proper intake. Right. Or even get in touch with a herbalist that, you know, know what you can have and can't in the yes. herbs that we take to uh, help our body, you know, to build up our immune system. In fact, I'll put, I'll post the website right now. We were okay. talking about... Uh, Mama Mawuthi Ashakir, as well as Baba Montu, who we, I mentioned earlier that they're presented at, with regard to our um, Echi Sign conference, as well as our um, Ojira Mind conference in the past and so forth, and Mama Mawuthi is in our film. Also, this is the website, their website, the Body Temple Institute of Holistic Health and Herbal Studies. So not only do they teach holistic health, but they also certify people to become herbalists. She's also a midwife. Um, so they have courses, but they also teach natural medicine, holistic medicine and so forth. So as you can see, the naturopathic uh, physician certificate, yeah. master herbalist certificate, um, birth worker certificate. She you know, trains people in being doulas and midwives and so forth, but also teaching medicine and also can show you, you know, what things you need to take, what things you need to stay away from, all those kinds of things. But that's the bodytempleinstitute.com. Okay. And yet I say thank you. Okay. And I say that. So that's the bodytempleinstitute.com. Okay, and as a matter of fact, so question was, do, do we have links? We look in the chat room, that's one of them. Let me see if I, that came up. Okay, the Body Temple Institute is one of them. Um, let me pull up another one. So you can see that one. And this is one of the ones that you'll see that I have on my um, social media. Um, so this body nurtures the one that I take on a regular basis. But indigenous, indigenous Alchemy by the sister Bast Tefnu Ra. She has that. And she has a number of different products there. So indigenousalchemy.com. So I'll put that in the chat room as well.
the best indigenous alchemy. And then also uh, the Raseki store. Raseki healing. And this is Rakit Kajara. She's also, she's also in our film and so forth. Um, but they have a store. So let me drop that. They have a summer solstice detox. They have retreats. She teaches um, Raseki, which is comedic Reiki and so forth, teaches healing. But they also have <clears throat> store. Let me find the hold on a second. Okay, so it's the Raseki store. So if you look here in the Raseki store, you'll see the herbs and remedies and a number of th different things that they sell. So I'll put that in the chat room. <clears throat> So that's Body Temple Institute, Indigenous Alchemy, Raseki Store. Okay. And just so when you see that we were Okay, when we were talking about the film, I think they were in the film and so forth. But we have a film on ancestral religious reversion, dealing with the voodoo tradition, juju and gangai and waga and hoodoo, which we put out a couple of years ago. And it is available online. And when we said, for example, the Raseki store that you just saw, that is the store owned by Rakit Kajada. She's right here in the red. And Mama, Mama Mawusi in the white right here, she's the one who's the founder, owner of the Body Temple Institute. Um, but this is the film. Um, we actually won a, uh, an award for best original documentary for the film. Um, so I'll put a link in the chat room for the film also, because you can watch it online. But we go into detail about how we preserved our ancestral religious traditions in the Western Hemisphere. So that's the link right there. And it's on the Vimeo platform, that's where it is online. And that's, that's where it is. So you can see the trailer and you can download the film um, right from that page. And then also one more link because um, there was a couple other questions And we have a couple of things coming up. Um, so on our Akungwa Suya page, on our institution page, right now we have 25 courses that we have taught on the, you know, 
and you'll see the flyers for all of them. This is one big flyer for the various courses we've taught. And then the individual flyers are here. As you scroll down, you'll see each one. So different aspects of cosmology and culture and ritual practice, uh, including a question, um, previous um, person who chimed in asked about um, ancestral religion and so forth. And in our Kuku Tuntum course, for example, we, this particular course, we go into detail showing that Jesus, Muhammad, Moses, Abraham, Buddha are fictional cartoon characters who never existed. We show how they were manufactured, corruptions of our ancestral religion from ancient Kemet and so forth. Uh, they made up these characters and these fake religions. So you're very clear. And it's based upon our book, Kuku Tuntun, The Ancestral Jurisdiction, where we explain that. So, um, but there are a number of different courses that we have. There are 25 of them. Um, so you can go to that page, the Akungwa Suya page, and you can access those courses. Many of them are six week courses. Um, some of them are four week courses. And since they have been archived, you can access the, arc, the videos for the entire course. Like for example, this Arikat course was a six week course. The six week courses are $30, but since the archive, that, that's when they're live, but the archive version is 50% off. So it's $15 for the course. And that means you get the entire six weeks worth of those videos for the course where you're, you're watching the course. The books that we utilize, the majority of the books that we utilize are the books from our own publications. Let me put this link in the chat room right quick. Okay, so that's that link. But the, the books that we use are primarily our publications as well as our articles and so forth. We published 31 books to date. And we have some more coming out. This is our Nhoma page where you will see all of our books. And in the class, we're going through these books in detail, plus other information that we have not yet published, but that's coming. So, so somebody was asking about diet and lifestyle and so forth. You have. Uh, some of the courses that deal with that as well. Okay, so with regard, some, someone asked about the soft cover books, um, if they're available for purchase. Um, hold off for a couple of weeks because what we are doing is we're transferring the soft cover publications to Amazon. So instead of us printing them, they're gonna be printed through Amazon and we have some new books coming out. So um, within a few weeks, we'll have an update on that. 